great privilege to be here in St. Louis. I've been here now nearly a week, and I found as I went around that this city has made tremendous changes and progress since we were here the last time. Several people have asked me since I've arrived here, what are you going to preach on while you're here? I've told them I'm going to preach on the love of God and how we ought to love each other. And that's one of, that is the key to the race problem. But how, how interesting it is how different we are in one way and yet how similar we are in other ways. And we, get to, we need to get to know each other. In Time magazine earlier this year, there was an interview with George Lucas. He said, I think there is a God. I'm not sure. I don't know what he is, what he looks like. I'm not sure about him. That's maybe how you feel tonight. I want to tell you about him tonight. I want to tell you about God. The Bible says that he's from everlasting to everlasting. How can that be? I don't know. There's a mystery to it all. And yet by faith we believe. And the verse that Mary Lou Retton left us with, John 3.16, I suppose I've preached on that verse more than any other. And when she stood up here and said that a few minutes ago, my heart thrilled. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Think of that. The population of the world this past week just passed six billion. And they showed a little baby on the screen. I don't know how they found that baby. He was the sixth billionth person, apparently, according to whoever was writing the story and the, for the television. This passage says, for God. I cannot prove to you the existence of God. No scientist can. How do we know there's a God? You can't put him in a test tube. You can't make a mathematical formula of him as Einstein did in relativity. You can't see him on a computer screen. But by faith we know that there's something beyond ourselves. I sat beside Mrs. Gorbachev one time at a dinner at the White House. And I went to the Russian ambassador to the United States, Mr. Dobrynin at that time, and I said, Mrs. Dobrynin, I said, I'm going to be sitting beside Mrs. Gorbachev tonight, and I said, what should I talk to her about? He said, talk to her about philosophy and religion. That's what she's really interested in. And I found that to be true that evening. And she said, among other things, that she was an atheist, but she said, I know there's something out there beyond us. A few weeks ago, she went out into that eternity. And I mourned with her husband because I knew them a little bit and loved them both. They were wonderful people. And now she knows. No, you can't put God in a test tube or a mathematical formula. You accept by faith that he is the creator of the whole universe. And then the Bible teaches in this same passage, or the next chapter, I guess it's in the fourth chapter, that God is a spirit. God is a spirit. He doesn't have a body like you and me. He's not located in just one place. He's all over the world all over the universe at the same time. The Bible also teaches that God is a holy God. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. 
God is absolute purity. I remember when I was a boy in North Carolina, we would all look forward to the day when maybe we'd have a little bit of snow. We didn't get much snow in the place I lived, but boy, when it came, we were excited. And I remember my mother pointed out something to us one day when the snow came. She put out some washing, some sheets and towels and shirts and things. And then she said, look at the snow. Don't you think it's clean and white? And look at the clothes, the clothes that she had washed that we thought were perfectly white were now dirty in comparison to that snow. And that's the way we are. In comparison to God, we're dirty. He is absolute holy. But the Bible also teaches that God is a God of judgment. The Bible says it is appointed unto men once to die, but after that is the judgment. There is going to be a time of judgment. And the Bible says that God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. The wages of sin, the Bible says, is death. But the Bible also says that God is a God of love. The Bible says God is love in 1 John 4, 8. How many mistakes you've made, whatever your ethnic background, whatever your educational background, God loves you. And that's what Jesus Christ was doing on that cross. He was loving you and taking all of your sins and all your failures on him at the cross. Have you ever thought why God created man? Many people are asking, who am I? What am I here for? Where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? God gave man a choice. God gave to man a free will. He can make his own choice. He doesn't make you a robot. He pushes a button and you do what he says. He gives you the freedom of choice. And so our basic problems are not social. They're not educational. It's sin. The breaking of God's law, the wages of sin is death, the Bible says. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved, the Bible says in Romans 10, 9. And that can happen to you right here, tonight. We've been all over the world with this message. Now the Bible says that we're scatterers of seed, and that's what an evangelist is. He's a scatterer of seed, the Word of God. And we don't know where it's going to light. Some of it will light in hearts that are prepared. Jesus gives it to us in the parable of the sower. Four different kinds of soil it falls on. What are you supposed to do in response? In order to know that your sins are forgiven, to know that you're going to heaven, to be absolutely sure that your heart is right with God, first, you must repent of your sins. Repentance means to change your mind, to change your way, and to change your habits. And the second thing is to come by faith. Now, faith is not some blind, irrational leap in the dark. Faith is commitment. We must commit. I thought a cartoon in the paper put it very well. Someone wrote to the pastor and said, Dear preacher, what does God forgive you mean? The pastor wrote back and said, All your files are deleted. And that's true. All of our files are deleted. And that's exactly what God does. You don't have to leave here tonight worrying about some things you've done that are wrong. It's all been taken care of at the cross. And you have received it by faith. Faith means commitment. 
Have you committed your life to Christ that way?